Knocks it through. Mullen bursting into the box. Josh Mullen. Mullen's ball across. It's turned in. It's Pittman who's got it. Livingston leads. Now can they get the ball back in? O'Brien. The lead. And Livingston have the lead. Man, the score. The full-time whistle blows and David Hay celebrates and the Livingston fans join in exultation. Livingston had the lead against Rangers and they are certainly rising to a few occasions on their return to the top flight in Scotland. Hello and welcome back to Talk Livy, the podcast dedicated to everything Livingston Football Club and Scottish football. My name is Angus and today I'm joined by Ewan. Ewan, rough weekend mate, how are you doing? Livy wise, in terms of the first team certainly, the men's team, it, it wasn't a great afternoon. It wasn't a, an entertain filled afternoon, we'll put it that way. And I think Nick Walsh must have been feeling a bit bored with these officials, which is why we maybe saw that dodgy penalty getting given to try and Increase the entertainment value at Fur Park, but we'll obviously we'll obviously go into more depth about that. What about yourself, Angus? How's your weekend been? Uh yeah, mixed as well, I guess, you know, based off of the two results. But yeah, if we're gonna dive straight into that, it'll be an interesting one. I think obviously we said about we're gonna go into depth about, you know, the Motherwell game. Maybe that's gonna be a bit too much considering, you know, absolutely nothing really happened, but we'll try our best, you know, give us stick with us for this episode. It may be a relatively short one in that regard, but plenty of stuff to, to go over uh, in the women's game. I will guarantee that though as well. But as always, you can find this episode as well as all of our others on your preferred podcast streaming sites. Just search for Talk Livy, so follow us or subscribe to ensure you don't miss another episode. We'll kick the episode off by discussing Livy's defeat at Fur Park. This penalty controversy proved the difference. Next up, we'll chat about our women's team as they left it late to secure all three points in an exciting game against Renfrew. Finally, I caught up with Glenn Schroeder from Red Tinty Glasses to look ahead to our trip to Pataudry to take on Aberdeen. The Lions made the trip to Fur Park looking to end a 20-year hoodoo against Mullerwell. Sadly, it wasn't to be as a controversial penalty proved to be the difference. Ewan, what was your take on the game? Yeah, I've just gone into my notes on my phone to to get my notes on the game and there's not a lot. <laughs> there's not a lot of notes there, I guess, so I'm going to try and do my best with this. But, <laughs> I mean, first of all, it was it was an unchanged team, wasn't it, from the, the previous two games, certainly. Or one change being from the first four games of the season, Montano coming at left back for Kinkar, which I don't think anyone would have hesitated about, given the level of performances in the first three games of the season. Listening to Davies' comments after the game, I think he had been toying with the idea of making a couple of changes in terms of the shape and things like that throughout the week. But, you know, I was listening to folk and, and reading comments online, everyone was saying, oh, he should, have, he should have played this person, he should have played this person. And I always talk about that everyone's a great manager in hindsight. And I think folk would have questioned Davy had he made loads of changes to the team. Who, who were like the main people that were being like called for to start? I think m- more attacking threat. Uh, I think some folk maybe saw it as a, a bit defensive, having Pitts and Shinny in there as the kind of two inside tens, maybe a bit more width about us. And certainly one of the changes Davy made through the game was bringing the likes of Baham Bull on to maybe give you a little bit more out wide. That obviously didn't materialise quite as planned, but to kind of speak about the game itself, the first half was, best way I can describe it, it felt a bit pre-season, like, it just seemed like two teams kind of going through the motions, cancelling each other out a lot. Nicky Devlin had an effort, which was comfortably saved by Liam Kelly, and Ricky Lamy had a, a header at the back post for Motherwell, which he's put well wide in the end, but really in the first half there was 
there was absolutely nothing in the game. It was, yeah, as I say, there wasn't a, any sort of real tempo to it at all. But I also thought there was a number of our players didn't didn't really stand their authority on the game. And again, listening to the likes of Jack Fitzwater's interview, I read Jason Hoke's comments. I think that's evident across the board that the players felt that as well after the game. Like, so Nubley didn't quite stamp his authority. I think Motherwell handled him really well. They almost doubled up on him any time the ball was coming into the forward areas, putting a man in front of him and a man behind him to stop him getting the ball under control and, and being able to try and link the game. Second half, I think Motherwell were the better side, albeit without creating anything genuine in terms of threatening our goal. And as I say, I think the officials got bored and have created a decision out of absolutely nothing. I mean, I'm going to go into rant mode here, Angus. I can't understand how the officials can give the decision in the first place because Nick Walsh can't give it. I don't think he's given it. I'm not going to blame him because he's <laughs> because his view is obscured, so he can't give it. He's obviously relying on his linesman. But if you look at the clip again, the linesman's view is obscured. So how can the linesman give that? How can the linesman be 100% certain that's a handball? There's no way he can be 100% certain that that is a handball. I mean, it's not a handball. It's quite clearly come off his midriff and gone out. I genuinely think he's given it off of Sean Goss and his reaction. I genuinely think that's what the linesman has said. Oh, that's a handball. Is based off one player's reaction. Because even, even in the stadium, granted, we're the opposite side of the ground, so we couldn't really tell what had happened in real time. It wasn't until seeing it after the game. But even Motherwell fans down that end of the ground weren't shouting for anything. Which, you know, normally if it's such an obvious handball, you'd have, you know, two stands up in uproar looking for the decision. You didn't even get a reaction out of them. Half the Motherwell players weren't appealing. I can't understand how he's managed to give a handball. Between between the officials, it's it's an absolute joke. And looking across the board at some of the decisions in the Premiership this weekend. I was watching sports scene and I reckon there's been eight or nine major calls in games this weekend. And I reckon the officials have got at least six or seven of them badly wrong, which is terrible, which is absolutely terrible. And again, I'll kind of come on to that when we're talking about the, the red card. But look, Motherwell took advantage of that stroke of luck. Van Veens went and took the penalty away. And David tried to make a couple of changes to get us back in the game. As we mentioned, Baham Bula was one of the players that came on and he's got two quick bookings. I'll be honest, at the game, I didn't really question the yellow cards. I think the first one, it's, and we've seen a lot of these ones again in the Premiership over the weekend, it's one of those ones he's trying to stop the, a promising attack. But I don't I don't think there's a great deal in it to give a yellow card looking back at it. Spittle's just got across the front of him. Baham Bula can't really move. You know, it's one of those ones. The second one, it's a daft challenge given he's on a yellow card. But again, I don't think he's made a great deal of contact. And then if you look at decisions up at Ross County this weekend, the two that were given as yellow cards, which have got to be the clearest as day red cards you've ever seen, especially the Ross Callahan one. The Ross Callahan one is a disgusting tackle. And that was a yellow card. And you look at what Baham Bull has got two yellow cards for. <sighs> it's, it's utterly, utterly astonishing. But we tried we tried our best to get back in the game, but it was it was essentially too little too late from us. It was a bit of desperation in the end. David kind of went to a 3-4-2 when we were a man down to try and get ourselves back in the game. Looking at the performances overall, the only real players that come out with genuine pass marks, I would say, the likes of Montano and Omionga. I think Omionga was productive in the middle of the park and tried to get his foot on the ball and try and string. Uh, passes together but yeah it was a it was a really lacklustre performance given the standards that the team has set I, I appreciate we're not going to be absolutely bang at it every week but it was a bit of a disappointing performance in the end but despite it being a disappointing performance I feel that decision has cost us a minimum of a point because I think that that game had nil nil written all over it the whole way through it and the <laughs> The, t- the penalty decision is just utterly, utterly baffling. Utterly, utterly baffling. Yeah, it's a it's a strange one. Uh, obviously, you know, last weekend, you know, we were kind of talking and raving about, you know, how 
not only people were saying about a good performance, but just about how you know great a game it was against Hibs last weekend. And then you know we've went to the literally the complete opposite this time round. Um, I managed to see the first half before before I was away at work, and you know the highlight of it was you know Rachel Walking Sean commentary going, "Oh, it's an hour, it's an hour goal kick." Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like, genuinely, I, it seemed as if it was like, every two minutes. And um, that was all that was you know being and um, being talked about in that regard. But yeah, as you're saying, you know, considering you know how kind of poor we were, how little we kind of created what we did on the ball. To be losing out due to, you know, a decision like that is it's ridiculous. And, you know, I've seen a lot of people like saying about, you know, like, oh, like referees and all of that, like, you, like if they're not like full time in that, you can't expect them to get the big decisions correct and stuff like that. Nonsense. There's so many of these decisions that are absolutely clear as day that it's just sheer incompetence that is costing them. You mean you talk about that Ross Callahan one? Absolutely ridiculous. If a referee doesn't think that's a red card, that's nothing to do with, you know, any sort of brain in that. That's just being a poor referee you know as you're saying you know there's the referees a uh, eyesight is obstructed by players so is the linesman they're basically hedging their bets and hoping that they get it right in terms of our one and you know for that it just makes it you know clear that you know we do need VAR I mean I'm not entirely thrilled about it in all honesty I think it is going to be a little bit annoying at times you know knowing whether to celebrate or not but you know whenever we're getting such basic decisions incorrect then, yeah, it's massively needed. Going to that Rangers game as well, the John Lundstrom one, yeah, it's a yellow card, but I don't think anywhere near a red card either. It just, it's it's really, really strange what's happened this weekend. It seems as if, you know, that Rangers game set the tempo, word got out, and then every referee was like, right, we've got to try and cover the backs. No, it just makes the game look even more ridiculous and even poor from, poor from their standards as well. But, yeah, I guess we've just got to kind of take this one on the chin and shrug it off. I mean, we've said that, probably too many times in recent times, haven't we? I mean, we were denied a penalty to go 3-0 up against Motherwell in the last day of, like, the pre-split games, penalty against St. Johnston that we shouldn't have got. I mean, that handball against St. Johnston last season that we didn't get compared to this one that Motherwell, well, uh, Motherwell have got, <laughs> it's just incredible to see. I don't think, to be fair, anybody is coming out of this saying, you know, that we necessarily deserved anything from the game. Did Motherwell necessarily do so either? No, not really. Aye, certainly not a classic and not one that's going to live long in the memories of many fans and just key to put that out of our out of sight, you know, for next week going away to Aberdeen. I think that's the best way to look at it. As you say, you know, listening to Davies' comments and, and some of the players' comments after the game, they're by no way trying to pin the game on the penalty decision. I think they've all came out and said that the performance didn't deserve to come away with three points, barely even a point. But the reality is, the way that that game was panning out, it was going to finish nil nil. I've got no doubt. I've got absolutely no doubts that, that game would have finished nil nil because there was absolutely nothing in it in terms of a creative spark or anything like that from both sides. And as I say, I, I genuinely think the officials have got bored in the game and decided to create an incident out of absolutely nothing. As you say, you look back at that. That two each game at the tail end of last season against Motherwell and the handball we didn't get to go 3-0 up and then you look at that one it's utterly, utterly astonishing Angus that a qualified official between them can get that wrong but it's not even that they got it wrong It's for me it's, it's guesswork <laughs> they've essentially guessed about they shouldn't be given the decision in the first place because I don't think any of them are in a position where they can knowingly give that decision that's what I find most frustrating about it. But to kind of touch on a couple of other aspects with regards to the game, you, you mentioned a, a wee commentary debut for Rachel Walkinshaw and, and Dave Black took over comms, so well done to them. I have to say, from what I've heard, Dave Black's much better than Bruni on the old oh, commentary. So not hearing those dulcet tones of that big idiot, I'll tell you that. <laughs> so Dave Black would like you to take over full-time from Bruni. That would be great. Even, even though he's here for another few weeks before he buggers off to France, happily... Happily listen to you on comms rather. Uh, <laughs> albeit I tend to be at the game, so I don't actually hear the comms, <laughs> but I'm going off everyone else's comments and I, I, I trust that they're reliable. But it was a, a day where history was made, Angus. It might not have been in the most glamorous of circumstances, but a certain Scott Pittman broke the appearance record for the club, 310 appearances in a Livingston jersey. We had a couple of moments at the tail end of last season where we made it all about Scott Pittman. Well, God damn it, I'm making it all about Scott Pittman again <laughs> this game. What an achievement for the wee man. Yeah, tremendous. You know, what, eight years at the club, 
to make that many appearances. I think we've seen that stat that we're saying about, you know, Pittman, how many games that he's, you know, missed since being here, something like less than 15% or whatever. And then, like, the games that he has played, it's about 80% of them he's played at the full 90. The commitment and effort and everything that's been shown from him is absolutely tremendous. He's a, he's a dream for any team like ours, in all honesty. Like, so humble, hardworking, and has quality as well. Yeah, an absolute pleasure to have him. And, you know, not a more deserving person of, of that accolade. It's going to be interesting to see, you know, how far he'll end up taking it. And you're probably looking at it the way that football kind of goes these days, that if he reaches, you know, kind of, you know, 400, even close to the 500 kind of mark, that's never going to get beat by, like, uh, by somebody at our club. It's going to take something really, really special to happen there for, for somebody to end up beating that. But I, I think you speak to everybody at the club relating to Pittman, you know, how great a servant he is. Everybody will say the exact same things. And, yeah, it's absolutely tremendous. And hopefully he'll be here for another couple of years and he can get that testimonial, which he'll absolutely hate um, being the centre of attention for. But, yeah, so many great memories and, you know, hopefully more from to create in the future as well. Yeah, as you say, it'll be Pitt's worst nightmare a testimonial, won't it? And he actually made a rare appearance in front of the media. Again, it must have been his worst nightmare breaking this record because he was he was dragged out probably by David Martindale to come and answer a couple of questions. But I think David did most of his talking for him. But yeah, you you mentioned some of the stats. I mean, prior to him breaking the record, I think Calum Carson had tweeted he's played in 91% of games, started 87% and played the full 90 minutes in 77% of the games. I mean... <laughs> It's utterly astonishing. He's a question whether he's human at times with those sort of statistics. He's he's frightening. And the level of consistency over those games as well is, as you say, he must be a manager's absolute dream. And I genuinely find it astonishing that nobody has shown a more of an interest in Pitts over, over that time. Don't get me wrong, I'm absolutely delighted that nobody has because we've got the privilege of having him for those 310 games and I'm sure he's going to hit much higher numbers than that in his time at Livy and I think a club like ourselves I think it will be near on impossible to break whatever Pitt sets in his time at the football club I can't I can't speak highly enough of him he's, he's just an absolute dream he's a fan's favourite he's a local lad he's everything you want in a player that represents your football club in Scott Pittman and Quite simply, he's the best signing we've ever made. And in my opinion, I think he's probably our greatest ever player in terms of what he's achieved at the football club. I, I'd go out on a limb saying that. One thing that I think would be magnificent is if this club could get somehow qualify for European football and Pitts gets the opportunity to represent the club at that level. I think that would be the absolute icing on the cake for, for Pitts. But in terms of what was a, a poor afternoon at Fir Park, there was a little, a little glimmer of light which was Pitts breaking that record. So congratulations, Pitts. And here's the here's the hitting the 400 mark next. I'm sure you'll get that pretty soon. The Lionesses were in action in their first home league game of the season. It would prove eventful, as despite leading 2-0, it would take a late winner from Shannon Mulligan to secure a 3-2 win after a late fight back by Renfrew. Angus, you were able to take the game in. How did the girls perform? Uh, it was kind of a, a performance of two halves, in all honesty. Barely even, the game had barely even kicked off and, you know, we'd taken the lead like immediately. They were great with, like, pressing, keeping the ball Shannon Mulligan ended up getting like Freddie through, takes an absolute wonderful touch and, you know, plays Ashley Fish through who does what Ashley Fish does essentially and just scored straight away. Two minutes in, you're thinking, wow, this is going to be something else. I think a couple of moments after, uh, Ashley Fish laid off Shannon Mulligan who struck the post from the edge of the box and it was just, you know, kind of a barrage at that point. Livingston started off, you know, incredibly well. First home game of the season, you know, in front of a Strong crowd of 241, which is really great to see. You know, a whole bunch of uh, people there for the first time. I think there was a couple of local teams who had gotten more involved as well. I think Renfrew had brought through a couple of decent uh, couple of support as well. So, yeah, it was good to see that from the first half as well. The first half for Lovey was just, in all honesty, it was kind of as one-sided as you could expect a game to be. They were recycling the ball very well, controlling the tempo. I think Nick Sturrock in the middle of the park alongside Gemma Mason, 
and Shannon Mulligan, you know, they were dictating the play very well, keeping the ball very intelligently. I think that was the one thing that was the big difference between both sides was Renfrew were very, very insistent on, you know, getting the ball from back to front uh, very quickly or trying to play like that impossible ball every single time. Whenever they had just one striker up playing against, you know, Jess Murphy, Tash Frew and uh, Fiona Walker, the player was just completely isolated. So everything that was going into the Livingston half was literally coming straight back out of it. Livingston were being so much more clever on the ball, you know, rotating it, um, you know, using the pitch, the width and everything, you know, creating opportunities for themselves. The only thing that they'll be disappointed about in that first half is, you know, that they didn't put it, you know, further out of sight. They did end up getting a second goal from Shannon Mulligan. Um, Ashley Fish, you know, found herself uh, out in the wide uh, area. I think she had a couple of crosses attempted. One ricocheted back there and she managed to put it back in. And, you know, Shannon Mulligan again, making a late run into the box. Great touch and a great finish to put them 2-0 up. But I think from there, you know, it looked as if, you know, Livy should have been going on to, you know, take more goals. Uh, Jen Dodds will, I think, be extremely frustrated. There was, I think, uh, three or four occasions that she made great runs over the top. Every pass was over hit. I think on another day, a wee bit less on the ball. Jen's probably walking away with maybe like a hat-trick or so, in all honesty. Vicky would also hit the, hit the post as well. So, yeah, the first half, I think, you know, the intensity was there, the tempo was there, what they were doing with the ball was there. Everything was solid. Going into the second half again, you thought that, you know, things were going to continue the same way. I mean, there, there's a great chance for Ashley Fish, you know, straight from kickoff, basically. You know, she was, probably should do better in a 1v1 situation, but the referee keeper had, you know, a decent game and, you know, was managing the fort there. However, though, like, for most of the second half, I think Livy kind of got dragged into the way that Renfrew were kind of playing uh, in that first half. You know, both teams were trying to play that impossible ball every time. You know, there wasn't much composure uh, in the middle of the park from either side. It was, you know, let's try and get it over the top. Let's try and get it in behind. It wasn't working and both sets of teams' as forwards were becoming isolated in that. Livy took off Jen Dodds as well for uh, Rebecca Giaconelli, who kind of went more into the midfield. So that left Ashley Fish a bit more isolated up top as well for these kind of passes that weren't kind of coming off uh, this time that maybe were in the first half. But yeah, I think the closer to the game, like the longer that the game would go on, I think everybody was kind of expecting something to happen. I mean, there's been a couple of times last season where uh, the girls have had, you know, two goal lead and, you know, kind of f- uh, fell back on it. I think there was a game Ross failed last season where very similar performance that they went 2 0 up, cruising, absolutely dictating the play, and then something happens and somehow they're back uh, on level terms. Uh, and that eventually did happen. A bit of slack play, you know, defensively saw a penalty being given away. I think Tash Farouk has been a couple of minutes late just on a challenge, you know, at the box, which probably didn't need, didn't need to make, but penalty was given. And to be fair to the last who stepped up for him for one of the best penalties I've seen in quite a long time, just absolutely quite a strange run up, but, you know, perfectly placed into the top corner. I think from there, the momentum then changed to being with Renfrew. I think with that, they started to put a few more bodies forward where you know, counter-attacks were more open for us. There was a great chance it fell to Ali Strike at the back post. I think maybe just taking a wee bit too much time allowed the, the goalkeeper to, you know, get back into position, you know, defenders to come over and put pressure on her, but um, that wasn't to be. And then, you know, again, a counter-attack from Renfrew this time sees their striker one-on-one, cuts back, wrong fruits uh, Charlotte Ferguson and puts it into the bottom corner. And at that moment, you're like, oh dear, here we go again, you know, two all. But you've got to have credit to Renfrew for that kind of resiliency, being 2-0 down and, you know, not really being in the game, not really having a sniff at goal too much, to, you know, to come back uh, within like the last 15 minutes or so and level things up. But even better credit to our lassies for the, for the character that they showed, you know, losing two goals like that would have been quite a sucker punch, continued plowing themselves away. Um, I think there was a free kick that Ashley Fish has had a header, like tremendously saved by the Renfrew goalkeeper who had a tremendous game, eventually got a corner from that. Ball gets worked back in and Shannon Mulligan's there at the back post, you know, to make it to make it free too. And I would say it's a deserved victory uh, for the Lassies based off of the whole the whole passage of the game. The first half was miles ahead of the second, I would say though. And I think that they'll be feeling that themselves, you know, that the the game management in the second could be a lot better. Just by playing, you know, just playing the same kind of style. I think there needed to be somebody needed to come on and, you know, put their foot on the ball in the middle of the park, you know, not just be like, we're already 2-0 up. We don't need to go chasing for this goal every time. Let's make them run about. Let's make them tired. Let's make them lose, you know, kind of all faith in themselves, you know, kind of getting back into the game. 
couple of slack things happen and they end up getting back into it. But, you know, it's early days in the season, you know, a couple of new signings are still coming in. Amy Hay made her home debut as well as Nick Sturrock. You know, that was good to see as well. But, yeah, I think there's very positive signs in there from the first home game of the season. And it's a game that puts them top of the league, Ewan. Uh, so, you know, two games in, top of the league, you're, they're the ones that most of the teams are going to be looking after now. Yeah, I had a quick glance at the league table and I think Drybra, who they played last week, have, have drawn one and, and lost one. But other than that, every other team up to Livy has won one, lost one. So I think that tells you how competitive this league's going to be this season, that everyone will take points off each other over the course of the campaign. But yeah, certainly I kept, kept up to date with the game on, on Twitter and it, it seemed a very much one-sided affair. As you mentioned, the girls went 2-0 up, but I think it, it's testament to them because, as you mentioned, there was a few games last season. I think I think one of the games being against Renfrew where they were a goal up and Renfrew had been bossed for the whole game, scored two brilliant goals, went 2-1 up with a, about 10, 15 minutes to go. And luckily the girls managed to rescue a point at home in that, in that game. But they might have been forgiven for almost falling into, oh, here we go again against them because I think every game they've played against them, they've been very dominant for large spells of the game and have been caught by a bit of a sucker punch. But fair play to them. They they showed a lot of resilience to get that, that winner late on, which, as you mentioned, has put them top of the league. Hopefully, as the season goes on, they can maybe be a bit more clinical in front of goal and, and put these games to bed early doors. But as we mentioned, it's going to be a very tough week this year because of the way they've configured the league set up and I think taking away the regionalisation of it will make it more competitive and all you need to do is take one glance at the league table two games in to see that that's going to be the case. So that's going to be a big three points probably come the end of the season and hopefully it coincides with the girls in a in a challenge for, for promotion. Yeah, absolutely. So very good performance um, for the most part. Very exciting game and, you know, it was very good to see, you know, a lot of people down there watching. I think a lot of people were there saying, you know, it's their first kind of time coming to watch the match. Seen a good reaction on Twitter and that as well. So, yeah, next weekend playing uh, against Air United at home. Fortunately, I wouldn't be there. I am away on holiday, but I'll be keeping up with the updates and stuff to see. But, you know, hopefully you know, there's people listening out there who, you know, fancy taking the game in and can get down. The weather was great for it as well. Um, enjoy that before it gets to the usual freezing cold where we're back in our usual spot, you know, head to toe and, you know, layers. So, yeah, enjoy one last bit of summer football whilst you can, guys. Yeah, I'll, I'll make it along next week. And as you say, great to see a crowd of 241. That's a, certainly a big increase on, on some of the crowds we were in last season watching the girls. So, yeah, if you're, if you're at a loose end on a Sunday, get down to the ground and, and watch the girls there's always plenty of goals, plenty of entertainment, plenty of chances on show. So get yourselves down for some for some women's football. I'm delighted to welcome Glenn Schroeder from Red Tinted Glasses back onto the podcast. Glenn, how you doing, mate? Yeah, good, Ewan. Good to good to see you again. A bit different from the last time we, we met in person, but hopefully a bit more positive um, this time too. It was a definitely different situation last season when I was appearing on the, the Talk Living podcast. Yeah, to, to give a bit of context, me and Glenn finally actually met in person. We didn't even manage to do it in Scotland. We did it in Dublin at the Scotland game. Yeah. But uh, last time I saw you was in the stadium, which uh, that was a bad experience. <laughs> I, actually don't even, I don't even remember that. So <laughs> I think that says more about the trip itself. <laughs> but as you mentioned, you might be a bit more positive. Safe to say last season didn't go to plan for Aberdeen. But with the investment in the squad over the summer, Bit of a buzz back about Pataudry? Yeah, albeit there was a bit of a bump in the road in our first home game. Uh, well, sorry, second home game against Motherwell. Didn't quite go to go to plan that that 3-2 defeat. But overall, I think, you know, we've invested in the squad. I was going to say invested well, but I still want to maybe reserve judgment <laughs> until we're, a fit, we're into the season. I, I still think we're maybe short defensively. Um, but certainly in the forward areas, uh, Boya Miofsky has been the, the real star of the, the summer so far. And 
looks a really good fine along along with his his old teammate Yilba Ramadani from MTK Budapest. Both of them have come in and added something up front and into our midfield. So I think you know Jim Goodwin's seen the areas that that need address. You know he has obviously addressed defensively with with Liam Scales and Anthony Stewart coming in to to form our new centre back partnership. However, I still just feel that. We saw this season when we've missed something defensively. Ross McCrory's had to drop back in there. We've just not looked quite the same losing both games, in fact, when he's had to, to drop into defence. So for, for me, I still think we're maybe a centre-back and a right-back short of, of being ideal. As you mentioned, it's been a, a fairly positive start. Four wins from four in the League Cup group, followed up with six points from 12 in the league so far. Has there been any signs that Jim Goodwin's kind of putting his stamp on the team in terms of a style of play yet? Because he, he essentially inherited the squad, kind of <laughs> McInnes, Glass kind of combined squad, didn't he? So he's managed to put his own stamp on it now. I like how you kept that very polite when you said what he inherited. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, he, he he is trying to put his own stamp. It looks like, you know, he's spoken a lot and we mentioned it last week um, on the podcast as well about partnership. He's really keen to build that scales and Stewart in the in the centre back area, McCrory and Ramadani in the midfield, and really get those fullbacks driving up to create almost an extra attacking force. We have obviously seen that exploited. Motherwell did a good job um, on their visit to to Petodre, and I'm sure David Martindale will have studied that very well. Um, in hopes that, yeah, fingers crossed that Livingston can cause Aberdeen similar sort of problems. I'm certainly hoping not. But, um, yeah, that that seems to be kind of the, the way he's going with the one striker up top as well and then getting men in that wide area um, and then runners in from midfield into the box. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk departures first because, as I say, there's been a, a lot of new arrivals, but... High-profile ones, Lewis Ferguson moving on to Bologna for, I think, just shy of £3 million. Calvin Ramsey moving to Liverpool as well for a substantial fee. How big a miss will they be for Aberdeen? It's strange on Calvin Ramsey. You know, he was only here for a season. Uh, but, you know, he was a big attacking threat for us, obviously a key asset for those that play fantasy as well last season. Uh, and he did, you know, maybe have his... The downside was some of the defensive work. I still felt that needed a bit more rounded and worked on. But from an attacking threat, I think that was a big miss. And, and Lewis Ferguson, he he will be a big miss, however you want to, to wrap it up, because, you know, top goal scorer for, for two seasons, getting 16 goals from midfield and both. Taking him out of the team is a loss when... Especially if you look at um, the start to this season, I think mayowski has got four goals already, and that's made him top goal scorer out of the last you know two years outside of Christian Ramirez so it just shows how how much Lewis Ferguson provided in terms of goals so when you when you take that out of your team you you need to have a, a ready-made replacement okay I'm speaking about Mayovsky as a striker but Jim Goodwin's addressed areas of the pitch that will you know provide extra attacking threat and hopefully pay off with goals as well as you mentioned, the Dons have been probably one of the busiest clubs in, in Scotland just about this summer with a number of arrivals and a few sizeable fees as well getting bandied about for a club outside the old firm. Which of the new signings have, have really caught your eye so far? You know, well, I've already mentioned him, Boya Miofsky, you know, coming in, bit of a high-profile signing in terms of money that we were putting out and obviously... You know, a lot of talk on, on social media about the fact that he's coming and taking the number nine jer jersey from Christian Ramirez and that being a key factor into him signing for Aberdeen. I think you just need to look at his goal returns early in his career in Scotland, you know, scoring on his debut against Wraith, then scoring on his home debut against St Mirren, bagging a brace there. Missed a sitter, really, against Motherwell, that one-on-one -on -one against Liam Kelly, and I think he's just too much time on his hands to decide what he wants to do but for me still inexcusably doesn't hit the target but then towards the end of the first half falls up with an excellent header Ramadani's ad added something in into our midfield as well really that kind of ball playing midfielder but kind of like niggly little tackles that you see these Eastern European players provide to, to teams so finally maybe got that little bastard in midfield that we've been crying <laughs> out for for so long and then you know People will agree and disagree about loaning players from, from Celtic, but Liam Scales has been exceptional. 
Um, you know, having to put up with David Bates and Declan Gallagher last season was a struggle at times. So to to get a high quality centre half in is has been yeah really good for us. Yeah, and that's despite the the fan protest for the flag about no more Celtic loads. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, that one that one turned out well when he then produced a, a brilliant assist in that game as well. And even his ball in for Miowski against Motherwell was was brilliant. So he's he's providing at the top end of the pitch as well as keeping clean sheets. And there's there's been a couple of stunning goals as well. That's another new arrival, uh, lad on loan from Liverpool. He's certainly caught the eye for all the right reasons so far. Yeah, I know. Something about um, loans from England and scoring decent free kicks for Aberdeen that, that seemed to go hand in hand. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Well, we've got on our episode this week, we've got uh, Jack Gill from, from Liverpool doing a bit of a more in-depth look at Leighton Clarkson. So we've been trying to get him on to, to see what he can offer, but he's certainly offered a few worldies going for, I think, goal of the month and goal of the season already in just three appearances. But you know, it's interesting because obviously, you know, it takes the headlines for the goals he scored, but that game against Motherwell, where where we lost, I felt it was a bit anonymous. Couldn't really get a grip on the midfield, but then it doesn't really help when your midfield partner also goes missing in that game and probably has his worst game um, in an Aberdeen shirt in, in Ramadani. So, but yeah, give him give him a chance from outside the box and he, he looks pretty deadly, so you've been warned. Exactly. Well, I hope Big Shamal's on on red alert for that one but like any season surely the ambition for Aberdeen is latter stages of cup competitions trying to get back into European football what would be deemed a successful campaign for yourself Glenn? Well when I did the 4-4-2 preview I said a successful season would be you know as you you rightly say you know going deep in the cup competitions but for me would be getting into the top six and I know you know Livingston fans will laugh at that possibly but I think where we were last season in the mess that we were in if we can at least get into the top six just now uh, and then build on that you've got to be looking at challenging hearts that third fourth place has got to be from a fan's point of view the realistic ambition for this season in the league but I think if we we get into the top six, you know, we had that opportunity last season and, and missed out on, on the final day before the split. If we can put ourselves in that position that we're in the top six and then come that that end of the season, build towards getting into Europe, if that's still a possibility. But I just think, you know, that, that Motherwell game for me did show, you know, the kind of the rebuild that we've taken under and that there is work still to be done. So I think we might have a bit of a rocky season with an odd surprising result to some here and there. But yeah, for me, I think we've got to at least aim for the top six and then and then onwards to, to third and fourth. The thing is, if you get into the top six, you've got a pretty <laughs> decent chance of getting European football, don't you, with it going down to fifth place, essentially. So as yeah. long as you're in there, you've got a bloody good chance of qualifying for Europe, regardless yeah. of what position you finish in. There's just one unlucky loser. <laughs> ah, exactly. So... Like, that'll be us. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> but looking at the game at Petodre, what can Livy expect from this Aberdeen side? And what I th- you have briefly touched on it, but what areas might Livy be able to exploit a little bit? I'm hoping that we get Livy can expect the Aberdeen team that turned up against the Midden, not the Aberdeen team that turned up against Motherwell. I think you'll face a, a high intense, high press game from Aberdeen. We'll look to be on the front foot. Albeit in our last two home games, we've started them very slowly. Both St Mirren and Motherwell had the better of the opening exchanges. And maybe, again, that's something that, that Davey will look to exploit based on what he's seen from Aberdeen this season. Again, probably that threat of Miowski. He likes to, from what I've seen of him this season, in person and, and on TV, looks to really hang off the last man and then make those kind of darting runs. And whether that's going to be a ball over the top or a ball on the decks to kind of looking to split the centre backs and then you've got the the threat of um, Bazao and Johnny Hayes running down both wings to look at cause the problems for the full backs but equally with the way that the Goodwins look to have us play this season you've got um, Hayden Coulson who came back from injury against St Johnson the weekend and then Jaden Richardson on the right hand side both full backs look to, to press on and attack and I've been quite critical on the podcast of, of Jaden Richardson's kind of lack of defensive desire. And um, it was one thing that the Notts County fans kind of said that he maybe needed work when he signed in the summer. And that was a side that Motherwell did benefit from. And I think 
you know, with the kind of maybe pace that Stefan Omionga has, could maybe look to maybe switch wings for him this weekend and maybe look to get in behind there. You know, you know yourself what it's like going to, to stadiums like Pataudry, Parkhead, Ibrox. The more Livingston can frustrate Aberdeen, the more likely is the fans will get frustrated with probably the expectation that we should be, you know, turning up and winning two or three nil. That's not how football works, unfortunately. And, and you know, it will be, a, I think there will be a difficult game because based on how we did okay in dealing with Kevin Van Veen, but seeing the way Nubly started this season, that, that gives me a bit of cause for concern as well. Hopefully Joe's performing a little bit better than he did against Marlowe. In fact, uh, it seems it seems to be a consistent thing for us that both yeah. of us have played not particularly great against Marlowe. <laughs> yeah. uh, our performance wasn't very good at the weekend, but let's go predictions then, Glenn. What what are you expecting? I'm, I'm sure you're going to be fancying Aberdeen. Yeah, of course, I'm not going to come in here and say that you are going to win, but, <laughs> but, you know, of course, you know I'm not going to come on this podcast and not mention the fact that you've got a long trip up north, so I'm wondering how that's going to affect I'm going to say, I don't know, because I really feel if I say these are not going to score, Nubly is going to come back to haunt me. Uh, no, I'll go with it. I'll go 2-0 Aberdeen. 2-0 Aberdeen. Well, hopefully you're, hopefully you're terribly wrong. Yeah. But no, Glenn, thanks again for coming on the podcast. For those that haven't maybe tuned in to Red Tinted Glasses before, where can they find you? Yeah, you can find us over on YouTube, Red Tinted Glasses. Just type that in the search bar and it'll um, pop up with our channel. Um, if you want to see Leighton Clarkson go from the weekend, you can check out our latest episode when it comes out. Um, and then also just normal podcast streaming sites if listening is your thing. Spotify, Podbean, Apple Podcasts. Just again, search Red Tinted Glasses and you'll find us. Perfect. Well, thank you again for coming on the podcast and best of luck for Aberdeen for the remainder of the season as well. Yeah, and best of luck to you, of course, unless it's against us. <laughs> <laughs> That's it for this week's episode of Talk Livy. Thanks again to every single one of you for tuning in week in and week out. If you can, we'd love to hear your feedback. I or leave us a review on iTunes or simply message us on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram. As Angus said, we're on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram, so search Talk Livy to find us and you'll find all the links to our weekly episodes on there as well. You can also find all our episodes, including this one, on all good podcast streaming sites, including iTunes and Spotify. We're also on YouTube, so don't forget to subscribe to the channel. And if none of those options suit you, all you have to do is head to our website, totlivypodcast.libson.com, where you'll find every single episode we've done over the last few years. That's it for this week. Thanks again to all our listeners for tuning in. Let's hope for another great week for the Lovian's finest football team. Do that.